It was her 15-year-old sister, Tammy. Bernardo convinced Carla to help him satisfy his obsession with Tammy by aiding him in a clandestine sexual assault on the teenager. Hamolka didn't lift a finger to save her sister from Bernardo. He was being physically and verbally abusive to me at that time, as you know. Um, he kept on pushing and pushing and pushing, and I said, finally I said, okay. And thinking that it would it wouldn't be, you know, it would just be one time. That's it. It would shut him up, and he would stop bothering me and stop hurting me. This Christmas video was shot just hours before the attack. Are you in the Christmas cheer? That's all I want to know. Tammy is already woozy from tranquilizer spiked drinks that would soon render her unconscious. While being sexually assaulted by her big ice. sister and Wait, Bernardo, Tammy would choke and die. Ice? Ice baby to go? At the time, the couple's lies convinced police Tammy's death was an accident, but it would return to haunt Carla. She offered up her sister in order to keep happy the man she wanted to marry. Yes. Offering up her sister is not explainable by battered wife syndrome. She was living at home at the time they weren't married. Well, I don't think she was a full-blown battered wife at that point, but I think the earliest beginnings of it were already underway. She was already following, falling into his thrall at that point. That was my opinion when I saw her, that she was, in fact, an influenced person. Influenced person. That's not battered wife syndrome at that time. What was she suffering from, if anything, at the time she offered up her sister to be sexually assaulted, videotaped, and to be put in jeopardy, which eventually killed her. I, I can't really answer that. I think that it was an outrageous act. Carla Hamolka herself has told a number of stories about her state of mind at the time of Tammy's death. In an audio taped interview with police before she became implicated in the murders, she says the couple's first three years were happy ones. It was great. It was, it was, real, it was really good. It was pretty well the same all the way through, except we became emotionally closer. And there were never any problems, or very rarely any problems. We had a couple of arguments, but just normal arguments. In fact, she moved in with Bernardo, and seeming to forget her sister's death, continued her pre-wedding social whirl of showers, fittings, and parties. All right. Who's, who's ever dominant in this relationship? At the end of June 1991, Hamolka married the man she would later claim had abused her so badly. As Hamolka and Bernardo paraded their union through the storybook town of Niagara-on-the-Lake, a nightmare was discovered in nearby Lake Gibson. Entombed in eight concrete blocks, the dismembered body of 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey. What no one knew was that the newlyweds were already bound by ties stronger than marriage, the killing of two innocent teenage girls. And uh, then she took a breath, and that freaked me out even more. I when we return, Hamolka tells police about the murders. So he went over to her and he did the same thing, he strangled her more. And I think I watched that time, because what the hell, she's dead anyway. Hamolka's evidence was that two weeks before the wedding, Bernardo had awakened her with the news he'd kidnapped a teenage girl and brought her home. Hamolka's response was to go back to sleep. The next day, while Bernardo raped Leslie Mahaffey in the guest room, Hamolka passed the time reading and walking their dog, Buddy. Hamolka was upset, but not for Mahaffey. Oh, and I was really mad, too, because um, when I took Buddy out, there were two champagne glasses on the dining room table. And we had these really expensive champagne glasses from France, which we never used. He had those out. The two of them had been drinking champagne from those glasses. 
I was really mad. It's a stupid little thing. Homoka seemed matter-of-fact as she recounted her version of how Leslie Mahaffey met her death. And uh, then she took a breath. And that freaked me out even more. I w he should have slapped me in the face because I was really hysterical then. So he went over to her and he did the same thing. He strangled her more. And I think I watched that time. Because what the hell, she's dead anyway. Like There's the what? Two weeks later, they were married and went on their honeymoon. Amoka later claimed to police and psychiatrists that Bernardo had cruelly destroyed her wedding night by telling her he was the Scarborough rapist. Although she'd already been involved in two deaths, Amoka would call this the worst night of her life. He, he wasn't loving. He acted like he didn't care that we got married. Um, he told me that he was a Scarborough rapist. And it just was not like the kind of wedding night that those dreams were having. After the honeymoon, Hamolka told police the marriage went well. There was nothing for quite a while, just small verbal arguments and things. And every day she labored over love notes for Bernardo's pillow, including this one, written just before they kidnapped Kristen French. It's Easter soon, and do you know what that means? A day off for Carly Curls to spend with her wonderful king. Isn't that great? Love you. He kept saying, go through what we're going to do. So I said, um, well, if we see a girl, we're going to stop. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask her for directions. I'm going to try and get her over to the car. As Kristen French was on her way home from school for the long Easter weekend, they put their plan into effect. So he wanted her right beside him so he could hold the knife to her. And I sat in the back seat, actually more in the middle of the two of the front seats. And I held her hair, and like I held her head down. French was taken to the couple's home near St. Catharines. Amoka unplugged the phones, closed the blinds, and locked the doors. Three days of sexual degradation of the 15-year-old schoolgirl had begun. When Bernardo left on an errand, Hamolka didn't release Kristen. Instead, while guarding the bound teenager with a rubber mallet, she carried on what she described as a chat between girlfriends. I never should have gotten to know Kristen because you get emotionally involved with these people and it really hurts. It hurts a lot more because I felt like I was friends with both of them, especially Kristen, because we did so much stuff together. We put makeup on together. Um, we talked. You know, just girl talking Paul was, when Paul was gone getting us food. And it just made it hurt even more. What Hamolka didn't reveal in that interview mm -hmm. was that later she had raped her new friend with a wine bottle as Paul <coughs> Bernardo watched. <laughs> Two weeks later, the frantic search for the teenager came to an end. No one suspected it was the attractive young couple next door who, with three killings behind them, were beginning to unravel. Now friends often saw bruises on Homolka, but said nothing. Then just after Christmas, he gave her a savage beating that left marks no one could ignore. The beating left her head swollen. The doctor described her blackened eyes as resembling a raccoon and said it was the worst case of abuse he'd ever seen. But within weeks, Homolka had recovered and within a month, she'd filed for divorce, hit the bars, and taken a lover. Carla Hamolka's exciting life as a newly single woman came to an abrupt end in February 1993. Almost two and a half years after they questioned Bernardo, the police now had DNA results confirming that he was the Scarborough rapist. Officers located Hamolka and she was cooperative until she realized they had connected her husband to the Mahaffey and French murders. That meant Carla Hamolka was in trouble too.